So exactly two days ago, Mr. Altman put out his observations where he observed that there is logarithmic scaling involved with LM models. I am not 100% sure exactly what Mr. Altman was smoking when he was making those observations, uh, but it had to be very, very good. This paper uh, comes out two days later. Can 1B LLM surpass 405B LLM? Rethinking Compute Optimal Test Time Scaling. This, uh, this paper does come out uh, from China. A lot of research papers are coming out from China. I've been pointing this out for a few years. Uh, and then so uh, this is around this particular subject. This is the best research paper that I've ever seen. This paper is a master class and a tutorial on test time compute. Um, and uh, honestly, a direct uh, rebuttal to Mr. Altman's claims that uh, logarithmic scaling is at play when it comes to LM models, because it's very clearly not the case here. <laughs> As uh, you can see from the headline, they're very, and, and they map it out very clearly within this study. They take a uh, 0.5B um, LM model and it beats GPT 40, DeepSeq, and a 405B LAMA model uh, on their benchmark tests. So uh, utilizing test time scaling, you're able to do a lot of good things and a lot of cool things. So let's dive into and spend some time talking about test time scaling within this video because they do a, a very good job of outlining this for you and giving you a foundation. Uh, and then I'll give you a deeper foundation as well. I've made kind of a, a mock-up mock of this so you can see what it looks like in code. So we'll talk about it first in theory, uh, lay out what they talk about in this paper, dissect it, uh, and then dissect the code a little bit. So first of all, TTS can be uh, broken up into two categories. And then so you have internal TTS, which trains the LLMs to think slowly with a long chain of thought. And then you have external TTS, which improves the reasoning performance via sampling or search-based methods with fixed LLMs. So the bottom line here is essentially what we're doing is we're training the model to reason very specifically at the point where we have the test and the test question. So we're, we're training it to reason and to like back propagate and to internalize its reasoning, et cetera. However, you want to frame that into different terms. Uh, at the like on the specific question. So on a specific question, on a specific data set, et cetera. And then so we want it to essentially uh, uh, like generate lots of different prompts and then to score those prompts and then to go through and then do an internal mechanism, like an internal thought process is, is what we're building out, right? Uh, and that's kind of what it works and how it works. And it starts with this concept of chain of thought reasoning. Um, and then so a uh, chain of thought is, is essentially breaking up a problem into smaller problems into, you know, like, uh, here's a, a, a big problem. Let me think about it step by step uh, and go through and rationalize it. Um, test time reasoning takes that a step further where you're uh, breaking it up into different steps and then you're utilizing different methodologies. And very specifically within this, it introduces a reward function. <laughs> the reward function is uh, very key across um, multiple uh, multiplicities of uh, neural network training that we're, we're seeing. And then so that very specifically makes this method a reinforcement learning type method. Um, and it utilizes Markov decision processes, uh, so MDP, uh, for um, the essential backbones of these methods. So if you're familiar with like reinforcement learning, that's what this is. <laughs> uh, we're like, it's reinforcement learning at test time, essentially is uh, kind of the bottom line, right? Um, and then so within that, you have two uh, internal and external. So that's your first divide. And then your second divide is, is that there's three different methods that you can consider, right? Um, so it's uh, best of N, beam search, and diverse verifier tree search. And these are all MDP type methods. So they all fall under this framework of Markov decision processes uh, as far as their mathematical uh, like backbones. But they are, are all variants of that, and there will likely be more variants that will pop up, uh, and and uh, perhaps there might be a variant that is a non-MDP variant as well, right? Um, math is, is fluid, so <laughs> it will, we'll we'll see at some point changes to this. 
But so starting off and diving a little bit into these methods, best of n is the approach where the policy model generates n responses, after which scoring and voting methods are applied to select the final answer. With beam search, you given a beam width of n and a beam size of m, the policy model first generates n steps, then the verifier selects the top n divided by m steps for subsequent search. In the next step, the policy model samples m steps for each selected previous step. The process repeats until the maximum depth uh, or an EOS token is generated. Uh, end of sentence. <clears throat> Diverse verifier tree search. To increase diversity, DDTS, or Diverse Verifier Tree Search, extends beam search by dividing the search process into n divided by m subtrees, where each of which is explored independently using a beam search. So it's a combination of all of the uh, a plus b gets c, right? As shown in Beeching et al., a DDTS outperforms beam search on easy and medium problems with a large computational budget of n, and a similar trend is observed in Chen et al., where increasing the number of parallel subtrees proves to be more effective than increasing the beam width under the same budget. Uh, and then uh, if you keep track at home, like uh, I think Chen and Chan are uh, like, it, it, that knocks off, uh, you've seen that in, in pretty much like every research paper, right? And it's uh, knocks off a, a like a, a reference there. Um, but so within this, what you can see is, um, Two, uh, so internal and external, and then we have three different methods. And then it's all based off of a reward function and, and uh, reward models, right? So from here, this paper dives even deeper. And it will dive, uh, like, uh, if you want, again, a master class in what, like, deep into test type compute, you just need this paper. It's 34 pages, and it's, I mean, 34 pages of literally breaking down to you. Uh, here's exactly how we implemented uh, all of these methods. Here's all of the different methodologies in depth. I mean, literally, like, how to measure them. Here's the different benchmarks for all of the different ones. But at the end of the day, like, the, the major bottom line and, and what they come down to is that, uh, there's not one of these methods isn't better than the other, right? When it comes to like Goldilocks, there's the reason why they keep adding new methods is is because it depends on the problem. So uh, a very specific problem will have very specific um, framework that it needs for it. And this is a more and more common like situation that I bring up more and more around AI. <laughs> I think more and more companies are going to and more and more people are going to figure out this equation that the deeper that you dive into AI and the more that you want it to do, the less one size fits all it becomes. The more powerful that you want it to become, the more integrated into exactly your systems and exactly what you want it to be becomes, right? Which is a big antithesis to the open AI model. Like all of this and, and how AI actually shakes out is very much antithetical to the uh, framework and the model that Mr. Altman wanted to build out, right? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm just pointing this out. Like, if you look at Mr. Altman's background from Y Combinator, all of the businesses that he puts out, why, like, Mr. Altman grew up, he's a, a Silicon Valley um, maverick that understands exactly how that framework operates from the 80s to the 90s until the 2000s, right? But now it's 2025. <laughs> and, um, we move past that, and this technology is uh, something different. And so uh, it operates under a different framework, and Mr. Altman is surprisingly and or unsurprisingly simply behind when it comes uh, to that. And it's there's no uh, further explanation needed than that, right? So let's dive into the code of this. <clears throat> and it's very simple. Anyone can do this. Anyone can break it down, right? That's, that's what I want to uh, illustrate and and. Uh, pinpoint and have you understand completely within this is that there is no actual moat when it comes to these things. Uh, it, it's um, a pipe dream to think that like it's uh, unlimited scaling is the answer, that unlimited data is the answer. It's efficiency, it's mathematics, it's one person, OpenAI made the wrong bet and they don't want you to, to know that.
So uh, within this, the code is very straightforward, right? So like uh, for a test time scaling model, and, and in order to do this, I'm showing you a beam search. So like uh, I'm showing you option A uh, within this. Uh, and then so we essentially, we have our model and then I'm simulating a model within this and I'll show you that at the end, right? Um, and then we go through and then again, it's, it's all about generating our candidate responses. So our candidate responses in this instance are prompts. Um, and then so we give it a question and then this is, instance since I'm giving it a mathematical equation to solve, and then so it will generate candidates that it thinks will solve that. And that's all based off of a reward function, right? So how exactly does it do this and how exactly is it scoring itself? So in this instance, this model is both the um, generator, so it's generating the responses, and then it's it's the judge, right? And the judge in this instance is can be treated like a separate model, which is really cool as to how this works, right? But so the judge operates off of the reward function and the reward mechanism that I tell it to. And, and I essentially, I build it out, right? And, and then so I tell it, so here's your reward. Uh, and then uh, in this instance, I'm, I'm measuring it off of correctness, conciseness, relevance, and fluency. Uh, and then this is where all of it becomes very um, individualized, right? Because this reward is going to be individual, individualized based off of your individual goal. You're going to want to know up front and experiment with this up front uh, and change around this because this is going to be uh, matter whether or not your, your model actually solves problems and actually goes through it if it has a proper reward, right? And the, you adjust the reward. Uh, very specifically based off of what you want it to do. Uh, and then in the sense that um, this is all, I'm just creating a fake model, right? Because if, if you run this, <clears throat> let's say that you take my code here and then you utilize um, like GPT-40 API, don't do it, <laughs> like, like don't, I, like it'll cost you like $30, I think like 10 to $30 if you just run this once, right? Because it's, it's gonna generate like a bunch of problems like so what it does right, i'll show you exactly what it does right like so the, the output is is this uh where we're essentially we uh, uh so the equation that i'm giving it is uh, to solve for this equation here uh and then it generates six sample candidates uh from that and to try to solve the equation uh and then um and then so within that it uh generates the six and then it goes through and then it's essentially like uh, after it generates the six and you'll see this is super, super long. Uh, it scores the six and it, and it gives them criteria, right? And then so this is, it's evaluating its own responses. And then so it evaluates them based off of the reward criteria that I set out, as you can see up there. So correctness, conciseness, relevance, fluency, and then based off of these combined factors, it gives it a final score. And then it gives it an output, right? And then so based purely off of that reward function, which is why the reward function is so important, it's scoring all of these, and then it generates and it picks the best response based off of the reward function. Uh, and then so in this instance, it out of the six responses, it picked uh, candidate number six as the, the candidate that it picks uh, uh, in this instance uh, with the highest score. Uh, and that's the one that it outputs and gives the rank two, but you can see it gives a rank, rank one, rank two, and rank three, and there you go. So uh, very simple mock-up as to how this is working and, and what this looks like, right? So this is exactly what would be happening within this. And this is a real time example of it. And then so you can have the model uh, generate more candidates, less candidates, spend more time on the scoring, adjust the, the um, reward function, et cetera, right? Again, like this is a reinforcement learning model at test time, like at the, uh, like on this specific question. We're, we're doing reinforcement learning training, like, like real quick at the time, like here's the question, do reinforcement learning real quick, think about it, uh, and then give your response, right? And that's kind of like what's going on within that whole framework uh, and then outlining that overall. Um, so just going back to this paper again, I'll highlight it and leave it here. I can't, like this gives you everything that you need. Uh, can one BLMs surpass 405 BLMs? Rethinking Compute Optimal Test Time Scaling? The answer is yes. And they outline it here very clearly and very definitively. Uh, oh, and then one last thing to note within this paper and then so just in case it's maybe like the last question that comes up would be, so what if you took a 0.5B model and a 405B model and you gave them both this TTS method, right? Because I think uh, people might ask that. Uh, you would have significantly diminishing returns. So, so again, uh, everything like I don't know what, what Sam or what Mr. Altman smoked, but I, I want some of it because like it, it, 
you, it, it, he, uh, his observations are just uh, their pipe dreams. Like I don't understand where they came from because it, it, the real world data does not back that up. The 0. 0.5, I mean, like my assumption would be, and I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to pay like a hundred dollars to like do a test time, a TCS test on a 405B model. But my assumption would be that if you gave the 405B model and the 0.5B model the same question, the 405B model would outperform the 0.5B model, but it, it would be like, like maybe single percentage, right? Like it, it would be, um, the, the 0.5B model would close that gap significantly and would be taking advantage of, like, essentially you're giving the 0.5B model access to all the things that the 405B model is, is already has access to. But the one drawback with this method, right? Like what it, doesn't do is it doesn't generate new data. It doesn't generate new knowledge. So whatever knowledge that the model has, however it generates knowledge, whatever it, like its architecture, which is a transform architecture, it's it's still uh, that's still a, a a upper limit, right? So again, going back to to Mr. Altman's observations, there's upper limits in these things that are built into the architecture data itself, like into several other aspects besides just one. Um, and, and then so uh, here it is for you. Uh, I'll leave a link to you, both the paper and the collab. So hopefully if you like, if you want to get into uh, test time scaling, this will give you everything that you need as, you, as your start. Like this other content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.